Hi, and welcome to Sex Positivity and Sexual Health. Today we will be discussing the impacts of negative and positive perspectives on sexual health. My name is Sheena Paul, and I'm a junior at UC Berkeley, majoring in history and social welfare. With me today is Dr. Karen Scott. Dr. Scott is the STD Fellow at UCSF and California Prevention Training Center. Karen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Sheena, so much for having me. I really appreciate you being here today. First and foremost, could you inform us on what sexual positivity is? Yes, very good question. So sexual positivity, um, it is a, an, an attitude. It informs how we approach young people in conversations as well as how we provide um, advice and health care to youth around sexuality. And the reason why sex positivity is so important is because of sex negativity. And that comes from just traditionally the sexuality curriculum and the public health intervention programs that we have, that we have, and they have been very successful in preventing unplanned pregnancy, undesirable STDs, delaying early sexual activity. Um, but sadly, a lot of that work is focused on what we call like a sex negative deficit focused approach. Um, for example, this is an example of some of those approaches where we have, um, we're using kind of fear danger, victimization, stigma, discrimination, and morality as tactics to prevent young people from engaging in sexual activity that subsequently leads to pregnancy and STDs. And so a sex positive approach would be one where the message that we're sending to young people is more about like pleasure, is more about the positive experiences, the joy, the celebration, the energy, the fulfillment that comes from sexual and sensual interactions. And so what we would hope is that we're creating a space where youth can feel safe, affirmed, and healthy, and really see sexuality as a central part of a person's development across their entire life. And so how do we kind of shift from that sex negative to sex positivity where we are celebrating different sex and gender identities, expressions, attractions, um, we're encompassing people's dreams and fantasies, pleasure, eroticism, as well as reproduction. Um, but we're really seeing a sex positive perspective around young people and affirming them as opposed to uh, stigmatizing and shaming them for their sexual behavior. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I really see the difference in between those images and how they can totally send a different message to youth. What do you feel are really the consequences of carrying on with that sex negative? framework? So some of the consequences, again, you know, I think the intentions are always, um, you know, kind of honorable. I think the intention is that, you know, we want young people to have a successful life. But again, who determines that? And how do we engage young people in those conversations and in that planning? And so the consequence of always using kind of a sex negative approach is that again, youth feel a disgrace, they feel humiliated, they feel embarrassed, they feel alienated and isolated. So that stigma, the shame, the discrimination keeps young people from seeking resources and support from spaces and, and people who they hope would be supporting them and would be holding them, you know, keeping them accountable, but as well as being safe spaces for them to kind of have a conversation that may be uncomfortable, for example, like with parents in the home, um, with teachers in school, with providers in the healthcare setting. Those kind of spaces become unsafe for young people to go to. So at those times when we need young people to ask questions and to figure out how to be safe in their decision making around sex, sexuality, uh, family planning, they don't come to us because they feel embarrassed and shame and stigmatized. Yeah, so I know you mentioned parents. Um, a lot of times parents or just guardians want something different for the sex lives of youth as opposed to what youth really want for themselves. Mm -hmm. What do you think the role is of a healthcare professional in that sort of um, setting? And how do you think they can navigate maintaining sex positivity when parents might have not been allowing um, a young person to receive public sex education? It's a very, very good question. I think the role of the healthcare professional really boils down to like safety. And again, how do we shift our perspectives? And so again, we, we have been 
um, all of us kind of raised in this sex negative culture where sex is dirty, sex is risky, sex is dangerous. There's a lot of victimization, a lot of um, morality that's involved in that. And so when we kind of shift that perspective and really come from a place where we're recognizing that not all young people have um, the right of like just having a safe encounter of consent, of having a mutually pleasurable experience, of feeling respected and dignified and honored in their sexual decision making, then when we don't come from that space, again, it creates a barrier. So at the core of that, a healthcare professional and in a healthcare setting, starting with just the walls and the images and the intake forms, can put safety first. And then recognizing the diversity and the experiences and identities and expressions of young people in their sexuality. And again, honoring youth and involving youth in that process. So giving voice, you know, to youth experiences, having them be active participants in their process, partner with young people. And as a healthcare professional, you know, creating a space where youth trust you, where youth are being able to have a transparent conversation and where there's kind of a collaboration in that process. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So how do you think sex positivity really addresses issues of sexual violence, but also helps healthcare professionals un better understand um, their youth clients more in terms of sexuality, um, and different types of identities that come along with just a young person and their health? Again, those are very good questions. So I think one way a healthcare professional can do that is like, how do you bring a sex positive approach to that conversation in the healthcare setting? So we've been trained to sometimes just ask yes or no questions where we say, do you, did you, um, when? And so instead of asking those type of closed questions, these are examples of questions that providers can ask young people to kind of open the space to start off with creating a safe space where youth are affirmed. So beginning with, you know, what is your gender um, pronoun? You know, what does sex look like for you? Um, to whom do you find yourself attracted or emotionally and romantically um, attracted to? So beginning to give youth um, providers examples of questions to ask youth that come from a space of safety and affirming them are ways to kind of open up that space and be more sex positive. Yeah, I really appreciate that. How do you think youth can work with their healthcare providers in terms of transitioning um, within the um, education norms that they're used to receiving that revolve around sex negativity and really moving towards um, underst better understanding sex positivity for themselves in their lives. So again, one way again, it, and for youth to be more involved, um, it's again, it's just modeling differently. So when you're modeling different roles and values um, for youth and as well as for the healthcare providers, then youth can be better engaged in that process. So when healthcare professionals see youth as active and valued participants in their sexual healthcare decision making, um, that can change that um, that space, it can change the, part, the participation level of young people and have them be more engaged in their process and really just informing youth sometimes of their rights, you know, their rights to seek confidential um, reproductive and sexual health care services without parental consent or notification. So when youth know they have a right to these services and that um, the health care provider is obligated to sometimes inform the parent, then you allow youth to know that they are a value and that they are an asset to their sexual health care. Do you think you have any resources you would love to share with us? Yes, I do. So one example is the Illinois Caucus for Adolescent Health. Um, they provide training to adults, to healthcare professionals, and to youth. Um, they are a model of a sex-positive, youth-friendly, trauma-informed organization that really promotes empowered youth and allied adult partnerships in their training, in their program development, um, and they do focus on youth sexual identity, health, and rights. And then we also have a whole lot of other resources that can be found here in California, as well as at the national level. Again. Being, modeling examples of ways for healthcare professionals and youth to be partners and to collaborate um, in helping young people to make optimal sexual decision making. Thank you so much for all of these resources and for this conversation. It's been both informative and really inspiring. Thank you so much. It's been a, a pleasure and an honor. And again, as a healthcare professional, I had to relearn some of these things. So again, I just want to encourage all healthcare professionals to know that they too can be better at being sex positive with young people.
Yeah, I definitely identify with that experience in terms of having to relearn what it means to be healthy, especially involved with my sexual health. Um, and I do really hope that this information can be helpful for both youth and healthcare providers. So thanks again for being Thank here. Thank you so much, Sheena.